I'm absolutely delighted to introduce Nell Watson. She is someone who is both a mentor, um, an educator, an advocate for all things humanitarian possible in the future. In fact, Nell took it upon herself to work with a team to really ardently look at the pandemic and early alerted many people across disciplines, across organizations and across fields to pay attention to the, the onslaught of information that was not accurate and to research and find the information that provided more accurate, immediate details about how the pandemic was growing. So I applaud her for her hard work early on. Nell Watson is an engineer, she is a futurist and she is a social reformer. She is known for being a machine intelligence researcher and a pioneer at deep machine vision through her company, QuantaCorp. Nell is also on the board of directors of Humanity Plus. So with no further ado, I welcome Nell Watson. Thank you. Thank you so much indeed, Natasha. So we're living in a time of an incredible rate of development in the space of genetics and synthetic biology. And this is creating tremendous opportunities, as well as, of course, a few risks alongside. I've been paying attention, as Natasha mentioned, to this crisis and the research coming out of it. And now that we've had a little bit of time for the dust to settle, at least partially, we're starting to understand some of the ways in which genetics is affecting people's response to this virus. And essentially, sometimes that can mean the difference between life and death. We've discovered, for example, that people with certain blood types are less at risk than others. And we believe that this is to do with something called von Willebrand factor, which is essentially um, something that is, that is higher among certain populations, uh, particularly blood type A and lower amongst blood type O populations. We're also beginning to discover links between autoimmune conditions and uh, things like, like arthritis or rheumatism. And this is connected as well with certain genes. Um, and also that, that tends to influence outcomes within COVID. Sometimes our very distant ancestors can still be influencing us to this day. For example, within South Asian populations, they've detected that some Neanderthal admixture actually provides a protective benefit against COVID. Presumably Neanderthals had to deal with some kind of um, SARS-like disease way back in the, in the distant history. Conversely, uh, admixture from Denisovans, another form of, of um, non-homo sapien primate or, or sapiens, actually tends to, we believe, create um, more difficulties for people who have that admixture as well which is rather unfair. It's so much of a, a luck of the draw of accident of birth. We're also beginning to realize that certain nutritional factors are a big influence on how successfully we're likely to deal with COVID or not. Lactase persistence, the ability to easily digest dairy products into adulthood is something which is very unevenly distributed around the world. And this actually evolved in, in several different mutations throughout history. And this is actually a big deal because one of the best sources of vitamin K2 is dairy products. And K2 is essential for metabolizing and making use of vitamin D. Vitamin D is one of the most important aspects in how successfully somebody recovers from COVID or not. Studies have shown that having higher vitamin D in one's blood serum greatly reduces the risk and the danger of infections. And we're now starting to see a whole raft of research coming out, which is telling us that vitamin D is a very big deal when it comes to the coronavirus. They recommend in the UK 
um, about 10 micrograms uh, at least per day. And I believe that this is perhaps one of the greatest uh, interventions that we can make within this crisis. If we can simply create a greater prevalence of vitamin D, we may in fact save a great number of lives. The reason is essentially graphs like this, which show that those who have a high uh, proportion of vitamin D in their blood have a remarkably different outcome when it comes to the virus. And this is actually rather shocking, I find. And it's another element of tremendous unfairness because we see that in particularly high or low latitudes, so closer to the poles, there is of course much less sunlight and much uh, weaker sunlight. And that means that there's less vitamin D being absorbed through people's skin. And it also means that if one has a darker skin for dealing with a high sunlight environment and one for whatever reason uh, grows up in a uh, higher latitude environment, that means that the vitamin D in that person's system is likely to be much lower. Another aspect of nutrition is fructose, particularly the forms of fructose that we find in our modern foods, such as high fructose corn syrup. Fructose malabsorption, the inability to easily digest fructose is actually rather prevalent. It depends on a protein called GLUT5 and a gene which uh, relates to being able to express that protein or not. And actually about 30% uh, or so of people of European uh, descent don't actually have this capability. And so trying to digest this kind of level of fructose that uh, none of us evolved to, to be able to handle can create a whole bunch of metabolic issues. We're now starting to see that diabetes type one and type two are strongly implicated in negative outcomes for COVID. And another aspect is NAD, nicotinamide iodine dinucleotide, which is a very important vitamin uh, related to cellular metabolism. And we're starting to see a connection with this as well. So if there's a deficit, which tends to be more uh, strongly found in pe persons that are obese, that are older or have more metabolic issues, that's also creating a real issue with regards to the virus. Now, obesity is another aspect, and there is good research out there which suggests that up to 90%, but most studies say between 40 and 70% of uh, BMI, or body mass index, relates almost entirely to genetics, which is a, a very strong correlation. However, there are, of course, environmental issues, of course, diet and exercise, but also we're now beginning to discover that things like adenovirus 36 are able to induce a greater adiposity in the organisms that they infect. And so there's all kinds of other complicated factors involved in this than we um, hardly ever realized. Now, diet, exercise, and living in a clean and healthy environment are of course very important for the long-term health of any organism, including human beings. Our bodies are composed of genetic elements and of course, environmental elements. And these environmental elements sometimes manifest within genes as epigenetic changes. So essentially changes in the expression of a gene, whether a gene is likely to manifest at its full strength or in more of a blunted fashion, possibly even turned off altogether. There is an assumption that these kinds of changes to the uh, epigenes are not passed down through uh, the generations. And this is a bit of an open question. Um, there is some evidence that it may be possible, but generally a lot of that evidence relates to mice and flatworms and not necessarily human beings. However, we do have examples, some sad examples, of how these kinds of changes can be passed down from some kind of environmental insult. For example, with DES, which was a 
anti-miscarriage drug, which was uh, prescribed for a very long time, uh, almost uh, more, than, more than three decades until it was finally withdrawn from the market. But it, it turns out that the, the mothers who took this when they were pregnant didn't seem to have any negative effects but they passed it on to their daughters and their daughters grew up with greater um, issues of, of cancers and fertility challenges. And in fact, that has now persisted into the great grandchildren uh, and, and the grandchildren as well. So they, the, the descendants after a couple of generations uh, are experiencing things such as intersex issues and polycystic ovarian syndrome. All of this, caused by just taking one um, drug during pregnancy. And this is a little bit terrifying because we have to wonder what the heck else is going on in our modern environments. We have the examples of tetraethyl lead in car gasoline, as well as lead paint. And this has created a legacy of pollution whereby uh, lots of young people, particularly those living in cities and near roads, are to this day still damaged mentally and physically by these, by these chemicals uh, and, and elements which have lingered in the environment and will continue to do so for a very long time to come. But our environment is filled with all kinds of chemical insults, some of which may in fact alter our epigenes or alter the expression of our hormones in our body. These kinds of uh, essentially endocrine disruptors. Now we have a vast amount of chemicals in the world today and our households are increasingly filled with these chemicals. And we're beginning to understand just how many of these are able to affect things like the, the hormone system of the body and to essentially make that a little bit high haywire in different ways. There's a really cool project you can check out called myexposome.com. And it's a little silicone wristband that you can put on your wrist. And as you happen to go through life, the things you encounter, the dust you happen to be in, etc., this little wristband will pick it up because it's a little bit sticky. And you can then take that, that wristband and they will extract and tell you all of the things that you've been exposed to. I have a project myself at edcsymbol.org, which is a, attempting to bring into uh, common usage a symbol, a little bit like the biohazard or radi radiological hazard symbols, a symbol for these endocrine disrupting chemicals so that consumers can be better informed as to what is in the products that they buy and hopefully we can help to let the, the market sort out some of these issues. There are direct links emerging between these common ca uh, household chemicals such as BPA and the transcription factor of certain genes which are associated with type two diabetes. And so our exposure to these kinds of, of chemicals are having profound metabolic changes uh, within our, our bodies and possibly our offspring as well. There are some potential ways that we might be able to limit this. There have been recent successes in using CRISPR to edit uh, genetic conditions, hereditary conditions. And more recently still, we've started to alter people's epigenes as well. So to use similar technologies to uh, change sometimes the expression of, of uh, genomes or germ, germ lines, as well as epigenomes, all in one motion. Early forms of CRISPR created difficulties with um, unintended edits being added in. However, the more recent forms of this tool appear to be a lot more safer. And so perhaps we can begin to use this ethically on um, higher life forms. There do appear to be huge opportunities for using these technologies to help to improve people's lives, whether that's saving them from hereditary conditions or to perhaps undo some of the epigenetic damage that we are receiving from our environment. However, gene editing has a major squick factor. 
it is very distasteful to a lot of people, partially because there is a, a vision of some kind of um, Frankenstein-like uh, horrible creation um, where you put a, a gene from a cuttlefish into a tomato. And also, of course, because of the terror of these technologies potentially creating um, greater distance within society or um, greater inequality, which is perhaps not an unfounded one either. However, I think that we have opportunities to do things in the right way. And I think that what would be helpful would be a bit of a rebranding of genetic enhancement and genetic modification, a little bit like, like the following. Because gene editing is potentially a path towards greater equity. And it's not about Icarus trying to reach for the stars, but it's rather about trying to fix the things that people were born into in ways which are tremendously unfair and that we ordinarily have no way of, of resolving. And I think that we can. I think if we thought of GMO, or genetically, genetically modified organisms, as shall we say exogamous. So exogamous edits would be essentially when you take a gene from one species and put it into another. And that's what most people think of when we think about GMO. But I think when it comes to human beings, there are other flavors that we can work, work with or think about as we consider gene editing. We could, for example, re-roll somebody's genome into a virtual sibling. Essentially, rather than, than taking a gene from somebody else or some other population and putting that into an organism, you could essentially say, well, you know, this sex cell and this sex cell can make any number of different brothers or sisters, and all of those have a slightly different recombination. Perhaps you can re-roll your genes to move sideways into your virtual sibling. And I think some people might find that a little bit more palatable than trying to be something that you're not, as it were. And I think we have an even more palatable flavor of genetic modification of human beings as well. And I, I'm describing it as whisking. Essentially, this is about not editing the germline DNA in any way, because of course, germline DNA can be easily passed on to other generations. We know that. Epigenes, we're not quite sure yet. But within the organism themselves, we could whisk the epigenes to deactivate those genes or the expression of which are less favorable in order to turn on ones which we find a little bit easier to live with. And so by breaking down GMO into slightly different sub brands, I think that we can have a conversation about these things, which are um, a little bit less knee jerky, uh, which are uh, a little bit more uh, accommodating of, of a wide variety of concerns that lots of people out there have. So in conclusion, we need better nutrition. If we can sort out nutrition, particularly things like vitamin D and NID plus, we have an opportunity to save a tremendous amount of lives. We have another opportunity to increase societal equity by bringing these kinds of technologies, uh, particularly you know, genetic enhancement and epigenetic enhancement. And we have an opportunity as well to make this palatable and feasible in a way that works for uh, lots of different politics and lots of different people within society all at once. I think that's all from me for today. Thank you so much indeed. If you're interested in the slides and the references, you can download them all at the link tinyurl.com forward slash Nell Whisking. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nell. Um, I can see a lot of people enthusiastic about your talk. I've shared your, um, uh, the, the URL to your slides on, on the chat so that anyone can download them. Um, as much. usual, thank you. As usual, I do have plenty of questions. We have about 
five to six minutes to answer them. So I will have to pick only some of those, unfortunately. And mm -hmm. um, let me get to my notes. So I'll start with a question from Richard, um, who's asking, how long do you think it will be before we can detect and correct the generational epigenetic effects of these passed down defects on an affordable basis? That's a really difficult question. A lot of this depends on, on us not knowing for sure uh, the mechanisms by which epigenetic effects are passed on and whether they're passed on in organisms as complex as a human being, although they do appear to be passed on in uh, roundworms and things like that. I think that a lot of these idea, um, a lot of these ideas are technically possible at the moment. It's really about getting the safety up, which of course requires a little bit of, of experimentation and, and shaking down these techniques, um, as well as having a discussion as a society about how to do this in a way that um, makes people feel relatively safe and secure, and that these technologies are being used in the best way for the best possible results for the most um, amount of people that we can work with. Right, thank you. And uh, following that question, is it even possible to have a testing procedure to prevent multigenerational effects? At the moment, we know rather little about these multigenerational effects, except that they are possible. Um, and we've only scratched the surface about what is happening to our genomes from environmental insult. DES was one that we found. Um, but my supposition is that there's potentially dozens of drugs and uh, chemicals and elements out there which are able to do similar effects upon our bodies. And we just don't have the science yet to, to be able to understand the magnitude of the effect. If we did, we would probably freak out. Um, but I think it's, it's not too late for us to be able to at least undo some of the damage. Um, particularly that kind of damage that might be passed down to other generations, which would be very unfair to our offspring. Do you think a rapidly developed COVID vaccine will be worth the risk of downstream problems such as we experience with deaths, etc.? There are a lot of questions there because there are a number of different approaches that we can take with, with a vaccine. Um, and some of those are, are potentially greater risk or lesser risk, as well as there is some doubt that a vaccine will necessarily function because we're starting to see mutations within the virus, which may mean that a little bit like flu, it's rather difficult to, to uh, cover all of the bases and you kind of have to guess about which one one is likely to encounter. And so vaccination for COVID-19 may in fact not be possible, I'm afraid. Although vaccination may not work, um, I do think that we have perhaps even, even a better opportunity with basically ensuring that everyone's nutritional needs are met, particularly things like K2 and vitamin D. Um, I think that might be a better way of, of dealing with the situation, uh, even if, even if a vaccine were not to be feasible, which it might be, um, I think that if everybody had a, had a sufficient amount of, of vitamins in their body, uh, we saw from, from that, that bar graph I posted, you know, a lot of people would just shrug off the virus without any uh, significant issues. So I think that would be uh, one intervention that we could do right now that would potentially make a big difference. Moving to, towards the end of your talk, someone's asking, don't all ethnicities have gen genetic issues? Skin cancer affects people with pale skin, for example? Absolutely. Uh, often these things are, are a trade-off, right? Uh, things like, like sickle cell anemia, which um, affects people particularly from the Middle East and Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, that provides uh, benefits against malaria, right? So a lot of these, these conditions are actually adaptive. Similarly, uh, diabetes is another potentially adaptive condition if one is in a, in a resource-stretched environment, for example. 
It's only when we find ourselves in a, in a time of safety and plenty, and we happen to live long enough, that these diseases actually become a problem. And so, like most things in life, everything is a trade-off. And uh, you know, but but so long as as long as we feel reasonably sure that we aren't going to be living in a malarial swamp, um, or aren't going to be um, dying of hunger at 35, then fixing these things might be for the better for everyone. It seems most mostly physical diseases are addressed with gene editing, but what can we do for psychological diseases, mental issues? That's another very major domain of, of human suffering. I think we have a tremendous opportunity with psychedelics and entheogens when it comes to uh, creating a, a kind of a solvent for trauma, to, to kind of um, let go of, of some of the hard, tacky, uh, traumatic emotions and conditioning that our brains have. And we're now starting to get really good studies which show that things like psilocybin and ketamine even um, are fantastically powerful at ending depression, at helping people to reintegrate trauma that they didn't even realize that they had. And I think that we are on the verge of a renaissance in, in how we treat a lot of these conditions. And my hope is that that will reflect then upon society and we might be a little more chill and a little more friendly to each other as, as a result. I like that answer. How can we best politicize genetic engineering so that people do not associate it with new genetics? Well, I'm very wary of anything becoming politicized, particularly science and medicine. However, um, I think we do have an opportunity to, to illustrate the ways in which uh, we can create greater equity in society through these technologies. With, of course, I think, a lot of honest conversations about how we can minimize any downside or um, put people at ease regarding the fears that um, you know some billionaire's kid will end up um, having you know Superman genes uh, and leaving the rest of us in the dust. I think Is that I, I think that to, to to come back to that. Um, I think one of the best ways that we can prevent that kind of um, superboy scenario is to actually proliferate or, or, or to, 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 to make these kinds of technologies available to more, more people. Because, you know, I, I can almost guarantee that a lot of the, the billionaires out there, they, they don't have a better smartphone than you. You know, they maybe have a model that's like slightly newer, but they don't really meaningfully have a better smartphone. And yet we use that for everything. And it's, you know, it's welded to our hip. And the reason for that is because they're very cheap and they're very well cheap for what they are in terms of utility. And that's because uh, we've distributed them to lots and lots of people. And I think that if we try to prevent genetic enhancement, then what will happen is that the rich people will go to some far off country um, and they will have it done there and there'll be no way to stop that. And meanwhile, everyone else will be stuck either with nothing or else with some kind of government sanctioned uh, Trabant like uh, car, but in genetic form, uh, which doesn't really satisfy anyone and is very expensive. So perhaps enabling more people to participate is actually the greater way towards equity. Last question. Is there um, any, uh, is any of this being discussed at the governmental level already or any policy discussed? Personally, I'm, I'm not aware of, of any major discussions in this area other than bio, bioethics, so uh, a, lot of, a lot of the concerns. I would recommend uh, Anders as someone who can answer a great deal of questions on bioethics issues. Okay, fantastic. Thanks for your time, Nell, and thanks for answering, uh, answering all of these questions. I really appreciate it. I think we're going to move on so to the much. next panel right now. Thank you.